just keep on coming, don't they? I mean, we have one of these things every week now, it seems like anyway. But I tell you what, that last one we had, we had one just Tuesday night on CNN, and uh, the last one we had, that was the most interesting so far of all of them. I almost thought someone was going to get in a fist fight by the end of the thing. So these are getting a little bit more contentious. They're getting a little bit more interesting. And frankly, the candidates that are left, they're starting to uh, really thresh out where they're at on some things. And, and we're really able to, to start developing some, some hard and fast opinions on them. Uh, I want to direct you uh, to my written blog, which I uh, write as kind of a, a companion piece to this program, uh, kind of a follow-up piece, if you will. On Sunday night, I will be posting an article on that blog in which I discuss exactly where I stand on every single one of the candidates that are still in this race at this point. We've gone through a lot of debates, we've gone through a lot of scrutiny, and so I want to just kind of give you a temperature check, if you will, of exactly where I stand on every single candidate at this point. So there you see the address of my conventional written blog, and that piece uh, should be coming out Sunday night, uh, the uh, 23rd, I believe that is. So you will want to uh, take note of that and take a look at that. But for tonight, I wanted to talk about one particular piece of the last debate on Tuesday night. I wanted to talk about Herman Cain and his 999 tax plan. That plan has been getting a lot of scrutiny lately. It's been all over the media. It's been getting all kinds of attention. And as, as we know, Herman Cain has really started to rock it up in terms of, of his recognition and name visibility. And as such, his policies and his opinions are going to be scrutinized, uh, and that's a, a welcome thing. So I think we should do that. But I was uh, kind of taken aback, or I was kind of interested in how he responded to some of the criticisms of the 999 plan during Tuesday's debate. Now, to give you a uh, idea of where I met on this thing, uh, before we talk about specifically what Kane said and, and what kind of criticisms happened during the debate, for my money, I like the 999 plan. However, does that mean that I think the 999 plan is, is perfect? No, far from it. It is not a perfect tax plan. The perfect tax plan would be a consumption-based flat tax. It would be the complete eradication of the income tax. And in fairness, the 999 plan does not do that. However, it must be said that nobody else's plan in the GOP movement does that either, at least of those people who have actually put out a plan. I, I know Rick Perry keeps saying that he'll, he'll put his plan out at some point in the future. I'll, I'll put a plan out there in a couple of weeks, or I'll, I'll put a plan out there next weekend, or I'll give you a plan on Thursday. I'll have a hamburger, for which I will gladly pay you Tuesday. But of the plans that are out there, at least those exist that, that we can see, Herman Cain, to me, seems like he has the plan that comes closest to that perfect plan. Still a long way from it but at least it's a step in the right direction. So in acknowledging that I think the plan is the best of what is out there right now, and it's one of the reasons that I'm supporting Herman Cain, it came to pass at the debate that that plan was going to come through a lot of scrutiny. And we've seen over these debates as, as uh, the non-Mitt Romney frontrunner has emerged, as we've had several people take that position. They've always fallen under scrutiny for what they said, and uh, you know, they kind of rocked it up, and they got a little scrutiny, and, and came back down. You know, Michelle Bachman had her moment in the sun, and then Rick Perry had his moment in the sun, and kind of became comatose, and now it's Herman Cain's moment in the sun, and I'm hoping Cain can actually do something with it. But as, in the midst of that, everybody in the debate piled on Cain, just as they piled on Bachman a few weeks back, just as they piled on Perry earlier, they piled on Cain. They went after the 999 plan. So Cain had an opportunity to really explain this thing, and really answer the critics. Did he do so in that debate? Well, I don't know that he did badly, but at one point Mitt Romney got into a bit of a, a discussion with him about the 999 plan, and it seemed to me that, that Cain might have had just a little bit of trouble in answering Romney's criticism of his plan. Let's take a look. Will the people in Nevada not have to pay Nevada sales tax and in addition pay the 9% tax? Uh, uh, Governor uh, Romney, you're doing the same thing that they're doing. You're mixing apples and oranges. I, you're going to pay the I'm, state. I'm, I'm, no, 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 no. You're going to pay the state sales tax no matter what. Right. Whether you throw out the existing code and you put in our plan, you're still going to pay that. That's apples and oranges. It, Fine. Yes. And I'm going to be getting a bushel basket that has apples and oranges in it because I'm going to pay both taxes. No, no. I'm and not, the people in Nevada don't want to pay both taxes. No. Let me. So there you see the exchange between uh, Romney and Perry in, in terms of the 999 plan. Now. Let me uh, 
kind of break this down for you a little bit. We have all been in situations where we have an answer in our head or we have an idea in our head that we want to convey to the person we're talking to. And in the midst of getting that idea from our brain to our mouth and, and out in terms of speech, it doesn't always come out as clearly as we'd like it to. That, that's being a human being. That happens to all of us. It happens to me once in a while on this very show. You've probably heard me do it. So I think Kane's explanation really did not answer the criticism as much as he would have liked. Sitting at home, I think I understood what Kane meant, but I don't know that he phrased it in such a way that a lot of other people thoroughly understood it. So I'm going to try right now to, I don't want to say rephrase what Herman Cain said, but, but maybe explain it in a different way that might make a little bit more sense. And this might be something for uh, you know, those in the Cain camp to kind of keep an eye out for, because these questions are going to come up again. It's going to be under a lot of scrutiny, as it should be, because it's a, the plan of a leading presidential candidate. Those type of things should be vetted. They should go through scrutiny. So what I'm about to give you is a way that Cain might have better spoke to Romney's criticism of his plan, specifically the criticism that in Nevada you'd have to pay two sales taxes. Had I been Cain, or had I been uh, a candidate in that position, I would have said something like this. I would have acknowledged, first of all, that yes, your state taxes would remain whatever they are. If it's a sales tax in Nevada, that would have stayed the same. But presently, right now, if you are a Nevada resident, you pay a state sales tax, as Romney pointed out, and you also pay a federal income tax. Well, 53% of you pay a federal income tax. There's another 47% that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But 53% of you pay a federal income tax. Now, that income tax varies on who you are and how much you make, and, and the mere fact that it varies like that is part of the inherent unfairness of the income tax system and the federal tax code. But presently, you in Nevada pay that sales tax and that federal income tax. What the 999 plan, I would want to show in my answer that for most people, that 9% sales tax and that 9% income tax that are a part of that 999 plan, as a combination, the 9% sales tax, 9% income tax would come out to about what you were paying with the federal income tax or perhaps a bit less for most people. Now, Herman Cain has been saying, do the math, do the math, go to my website and do the math. A piece of constructive criticism for Kane might right here might be this. You might want to give us just a little bit of that math, just a little bit of a morsel of it, when you're explaining this uh, concept that I'm giving you right now. You might want to point out that for most middle class people, show the math, that for most middle class people, and certainly for wealthy people, this will make their total tax that they pay go down. I mean, at the end of the year, if your taxes go down, you really don't care if it happened by a sales tax or an income tax or whatever. You just want to spend less than you paid before. So if Cain can show that, I think that's how he can win the American people over on this plan. Now, one of the big criticisms of the 999 is that some say it is a regressive tax, that it will tax the poor. It will nail that 47% of people who are not paying an income tax currently. My answer to that is, good, it's about damn time. Now, I don't know that Herman Cain is, has been comfortable in really admitting that, that that tax will charge some taxes towards the poor. Uh, he talks about opportunity zones and things like that. And to be honest, I don't know enough about those opportunity zones at this point to know how that plays into it. But even if those didn't exist, even if there was not a caveat there for the poor to avoid this 999 tax somehow, I would be in favor of it. I believe, personally, that we need to start holding the poor accountable for, for what they're taking from society. These are the people, generally speaking, who take advantage of the social programs, take advantage of the welfare, take advantage of you know the social security benefits and all of these different safety net type of things that we have, while contributing little, if anything. When you talk about funding police protection and things like that, it's the poor that are commi committing most of the crimes. Think about it. If you've ever been carjacked or robbed or shot at or, or had your car broken into or anything like that, who was it that probably did that? Was it some Wall Street banker that carjacked you? Probably not. 
It was probably one of those 47% of people who don't pay any taxes. Now some of you, when you hear me say that, you're thinking I'm a little bit crazy, you're thinking I'm a little bit nuts, that, that I'm thinking Herman Cain should admit that this plan will, will actually tax the poor to some extent. Some of you are saying that is, that is political suicide. You would automatically lose the election if you did that. But I'm not so sure that that's true. When it comes to the idea of taxing the poor and getting the poor to pay their fair share, to borrow a phrase from our friends on the left, when it comes to the idea of getting the poor to pay their fair share, I think there's a lot of people that that idea resonates with. Consider for a moment this exchange, this question asked by Anderson Cooper to Michelle Bachman in that same debate, and pay particular attention to the crowd reaction to, to Congressman Bachman's answer. Congressman Bachman, uh, you also said at the last debate that everyone should pay something. Does that mean that you would raise taxes on the 47% of Americans who currently don't pay taxes? I believe absolutely every American benefits by this magnificent country. Absolutely every American should pay something. Even if it's a dollar, everyone needs to pay something in this country. So there you see that at least to a segment of the American population, the idea of taxing the poor, the idea of taking that 47% who do not pay income taxes presently and getting them to put some of the bill for what they take advantage of, getting them to have some skin in the game does resonate. Now a lot of people are talking about class warfare right now and, and they talk about how it's the rich versus the poor. I don't really see it that way, and, and if the left is thinking this election can be strictly rich versus poor, I think they're in for a surprise. What they don't realize is that it's going to be very difficult for a lot of us in the middle class to align ourselves with the poor in such a class warfare situation. As I've said on this program before, many of us who are middle class, many of us are around the poor each and every day. We work with them, we, we deal with them, and as we go through the day, going into the different places of business we go into, we're around them. Frankly, we're not impressed with most of them. We actually hear them talking about ways they can scam the government. Or we actually hear them talking about ways that they can, you know, miss work and get away with it, or, or do the le absolute least amount and not get caught. We hear them do that. We hear them say that. We're privy to it. And so when you are in a situation where the American left is trying to get us to feel sympathy for them, frankly, with a lot of us in the middle class, that's not going to work. So when you talk about a plan that might actually get some of these 47% who don't pay the income taxes, it gets them to actually pony up a little bit, we're going to be right on board with that. A lot of us are. Now, there's some people that won't be, but frankly, I think a lot of those people who, who are intent on having pity for those freeloaders, I think a lot of those people aren't going to vote Republican anyway. And it doesn't matter what candidate we put up or what they say. So really, all of that criticism is moot. All of the criticism from those quarters means nothing because we're not going to get those votes anyway. We need not worry about those people. We need not try to appeal to them. But to the middle class, to the working Americans, to the producers in this country, taxing those poor people makes a lot of sense. It's about time. It's about time they paid their fair share. And with this 999 plan, not to mention that including you know, taxing the, those who are taking advantage of us right now without paying anything, it also accounts for a lot of that hidden income that's out there. You know, All those drug dealers and pimps and, and other assorted people that live their lives on a cash basis and they don't report their income, guess what? That income is now going to be taxed because of the consumption element of that. And hey, all of you Occupy Wall Street morons that are out there that, that are so horrified that, that people don't get taxed heavily on capital gains and that the Warren Buffets of the world can be charged less of a tax than their secretaries, guess what? Under some kind of a flat tax or, or even this 999 plan, that problem would be solved. All that Warren Buffett money that he makes from capital gains, that money would be taxable now because he would spend it. When he spends it, he would be taxed on it. That should solve the very problem that you guys are bitching about. But I know you don't want it anyway, because really what you want is to fleece the rich. But you know, we give you an actual solution like a flat tax, you're going to ignore it. I know that. But since you're saying that the problem, part, part of the problem, is that capital gains are taxed at a high rate, hey, 999 would take care of that. Or any flat tax 
would take care of that. It would put that money into play. It would put the money of a drug dealer into play. It would put the money of anybody who lives on the fringes and, and, and doesn't report that income, it would put that in play because at some point they have to spend it. So the 999 plan I think is the best plan out there. But what Herman Cain needs to do is to perhaps better explain to people that where the 999 plan does have a sales tax element to it, the combination of the 9% sales tax and the 9% income tax replacing the current federal income tax would actually work out to a better deal for most Americans. If he can illustrate that with simple mathematics, he wins the day. He wins the debate. And also I think Cain needs to admit that yeah, the tax is a bit regressive. It is a bit regressive on the poor. And I think he might be surprised, and a lot of people might be surprised, at how well that will resonate. This might be the election of class warfare. This might be the election of getting people to pay their fair share. But it might not end up being a war on the rich. It might end up being a war on those who really are not paying their fair share, and that's the poor. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.